everyone. Um, my name is Alessandro Maltese. I'm one of the conveners. And in the name of everyone, I wish you, uh, I'd like to welcome you to our session on reading the Earth oldest rock record. And to start out, I would like to uh, welcome on stage Catherine Chauvel. So please uh, welcome her. I don't deserve anything. <laughs> Yes, so good afternoon. I'm Catherine Chauvel. I'm the president of the uh, European Association of Geochemistry. And it's my great pleasure to start this session with the introduction of the 2023 EAG Hutemann's Medal Lecture. This award was named after Friedrich Hutemann's, who was a nuclear physicist known for his many contributions to geochronology. Hutemans was a bold scientist known for his witty character, who had a very adventurous life, which even led him to be imprisoned during the Second World War. I certainly invite you to discover more about him. Our Friedrich Hutemans medalist has also forged new paths which have a significant impact on our understanding of Earth, particularly the evolution of the continental crust. Therefore, it's a great honor to present the 2023 Hutemans Award to Ming Tang. Ming, come and join me. So Ming received his medal in the plenary session yesterday. You might have been there. And I now invite William McDonough to tell us more about Ming and why he received such a prestigious award. Yes. Good afternoon. This citation is given by me, but it is from myself and Roberta Rudnick. It is my, my great honor to introduce Professor Ming Tang of Peking University as EAG's 2023 Outerman Awardee. He is being honored for his work and his novel insights into the origin and evolution of the continental crust. Ming Tang received his PhD in 2016 from the University of Maryland under Roberta and my supervision. He then flourished in a postdoc fellowship at Rice University with Sin T. Lee. And later in 2019, he became an assistant professor at Peking University, where he is now a tenured full professor. We first met Ming at a meeting in November 2010 at Peking University. He was interested in our graduate program. Ming simply amazed us both. He was fluent in English, delivered an excellent talk, and his recall of the literature and authors was that of a clued in graduate student or postdoc. At the time, Ming was an undergraduate student, eight months away from being a bachelor degree student at Nanjing University. From his earliest days, Ming had been a focused, organized scientist with a thirst for understanding the fundamental pro processes driving geological systems. Together with his undergraduate pro advisor, Professor Wang Zhaoliang, Wang Zhaole, Ming focused on understanding the genesis of Mesozoic crustal rocks in China. During this time, he published four papers, two as first author including a very interesting paper in EPSL on the zircon effect during crust Atlanta, Texas, explaining heterogeneous hafnium isotopes compositions present in zircons for most granitic rocks. Motivation was not going to be a problem with me. Keeping up with him was going to be the challenge. His PhD was no less productive. With Ming, he published seven first author papers and co-authored two others. 
He demonstrated using NanoSIMS data acquired in collaboration with Maitri Bois that lithium indeed diffuses in zircon, producing tens of mil compositional zoning, raise a sharp compositional zoning due to coupled substitution with slow diffusing cations. In Ming's Hallmark 2016 science paper, he showed that using nickel cobalt chromium zinc ratios in fine grained terrigenous sedimentary rocks, the Archean's upper crustal composition transitioned from mafic to felsic and suggested that this change in crustal chemistry marked the onset of plate tectonics. These works were initiated by and carried out by Ming with little involvement from his supervisors. Collectively, his PhD output put him into a league of his own as an independent and innovative young scientist. Later, Ming's science advance paper produced as a postdoc working with Sin T showed that the high FO2 continental ox magmas originated deep within the crust. Using high quality data they gathered on oclogites, Ming and his collaborators showed that in areas of thick continental ox, fractionation of garnet bearing cumulates at high pressure can simultaneously lead to iron oxidation and drive magmas to become progressively more oxidized as they crystallized and differentiated. This is a hot topic that has engendered much debate and further research. However, this is the very way that science advances. Since moving from Peking, moving to Peking University, Ming's papers further document his development as a scientist, his independence, and his leadership. In these publications, Ming examines questions of the thickness of the continental crust through time, the implications for crustal oxidation and the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. Ming's work is marked by acquisition of geochemical data of impeccable quality, careful data synthesis, and quantitative modeling. He has a sharp eye for recognizing significant data trends, which speaks highly of his intellectual maturity. Notably, Ming respects uncertainties and properly incorporates that into his modeling. Ming's innovative and transforming publications provide a firm basis for his future trajectory. We are certain that his leadership will transform the field for years to come. I give you EAG's 23, 2023 Houderman Award recipient, Ming Tang. Thank you. It's hard to see. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Bill and Roberta, for the uh, nice introduction. Thank you, European Association of Geochemistry, President Katrine Chevel, and thank you, the Houdemans uh, Award Committee, for choosing me as this year's recipient. I'm deeply humbled to receive this award, as I know there are many other early career geochemists who should get this award. Uh, I want to share this award with all of those who have uh, supported me and inspired me. I wouldn't be standing here without them. Professors Xiaoling Wang and Xi Sheng Xu were, the, were my undergraduate advisors. They were the first people who introduced me to the field of geoscience and showed me how to do research. Uh, it was also Xiaoli and Xi Sheng and also Wei Dong Song who introduced me to Roberta and Bill at a petrology meeting at Peking University back in 2010. And that meeting really opened up my path to the US for further study. Later, when I applied for graduate programs in the US, Roberta and Bill were the only ones who gave me an offer. I hope they didn't, uh, didn't regret it. Roberta and Bill are two great scientists, but with very different characters. Roberta was uh, very strict, but also very open-minded. I recall that when I first showed my uh, Archean crustal evolution work to her, Roberta was actually very dubious. She kept hammering on me, but she never really thumbed down my ideas and would encourage me when I felt exhausted. So now I myself have become an advisor and I often look back and ask myself, what would Roberta do in this situation? 
what, what Roberta say. So those experiences will be a lifelong treasure to me. Bill is a uh, can-do person. When I saw the impossible, he saw the possible. And it was also Bill who kindled European fire in me. So my work has been, my research has been so tightly bonded to this little element, europium. About half of my papers I read are based on the geochemistry of europium. This element is that magical. And I was also lucky to have spent three years working with Cynthia Rice. That was a completely different journey. Cynthia thinks broad. He never stays in his comfort zone. Or maybe there is just no such thing for him. And this really inspired me to always look further and think beyond. I joined Peking University in 2019. Before going back, I actually had been a little worried, although it's my own country, but I knew very few people in that community. But it turned out that my worry was entirely unnecessary. I got wholehearted support from my colleagues, including my undergraduate advisors, the university, the national funding agencies, and even some big tech companies like Tencent. They really know what early career scientists need, and they did their best to make my transition smooth. I'm deeply grateful for my parents, especially my mom. We don't always agree with each other, and sometimes we even fight with each other. But in the end, she would give me advice, but also respect my uh, decisions. Where I want to go, what kind of job I want to do, what kind of life I want to live, and who I choose to love. There are things that are too hard for her to accept or even understand. But at the end of the day, she's always there, standing by my side. I once asked her, I thought you were a traditional Chinese woman. Yes, I am, she said, but I'm also your mom. I'm been, I've been doing science for 13 years since my undergraduate days. I made some progress, maybe, but also made mistakes and sometimes got lost. Over the years, I learned from the people I work with, and I come to realize how important it is to be positive and inclusive. Doing science is not for getting attention. Doing science is fun. And it's more fun when people come to work together instead of attack each other. Science advances through inspiration. Thank you. So for my talk today, I want to talk about uh, hypsometry and continent emergence uh, on early Earth. When we look at a solid planet, uh, its topography is pretty much the uh, first and one of the most basic features we analyze, we observe. Topography can provide lots of useful information on the uh, surface environment and tectonic activity of a solid planet. Here are some uh, elevation distribution data for some of the uh, solid uh, planets and moons in the solar system. And here we have uh, Mercury, Earth, Venus, Moon, Mars, and Titan. So among these uh, solid bodies, Earth and Mars are quite interesting. They're very special. You notice that they have this very interesting bimodal elevation distribution. Well, although Mars is uh, interesting, but I'll keep my for my talk today, I'll keep my uh, discussion to Earth. And let's take a closer look at the uh, hypsometry of Earth. There are actually two plots here. The left panel shows the uh, elevation corresponding to each elevation. And the panel on the right, it shows the uh, cumulative area from high elevation to low elevation. So this uh, bimodal elevation distribution is very clear with one mode for the uh, uh, abyssal plains or ocean floors, ocean basins, and the other mode for the continents. So it's interesting to note that uh, the continent, the continent mode is actually very close to sea level, zero elevation. So that means that much of the uh, continental crust just sits at sea level. It's actually not a uh, coincidence. It's the, it's, uh, it reflects the uh, balance between erosion and, uh, and deposition. So when did this uh, bimodal hypsometry form? Or when did this uh, 
ocean continent distinction form? We don't have any uh, distinct, we don't have any uh, definitive answers to these questions, but over the last past, of past uh, couple of decades, evidence has been accumulating that uh, exposed land masses or emerged continents may have been very rare on early Earth. Uh, one very intriguing observation here is that the pillow basalts, pillow basalt, basalts are commonly seen in these Archean greenstone belts. These are clearly the features of submarine uh, eruptions. And here I compiled some other important observations. For example, we have this uh, triple oxygen isotopes. The triple oxygen isotopes in shales, they seem to record a major change in hydrologic cycles at about 2.5 GA. And we have this uh, oxygen isotopes, this is delta O18 oxygen isotopes of seawater reconstructed from altered oceanic crust. Uh, it also shows that Siberia crust may have been very rare before 3GA. And this potassium lanthanum ratio in the volcanic rocks basically shows the same trend. There is a downgoing trend between 3 and 2.5 GA. And the last one is by Lee Kum. They calculate, they compile the uh, number of uh, Siberia lips, large igneous provinces. And the number of Siberia lips also shows a abrupt, uh, abrupt increase about 2.5 GA. That's the end of the archaea. So none of these observations can provide definitive evidence for uh, the emergence of continental crust. But they all show this uh, very similar trend, the similar patterns. And I think that's interesting. I'm not going to talk about when continents emerge from the oceans, but let's ask the question in a slightly different way. Why Siberia crust, why exposed to continental crust may have been so rare on early Earth? So what controls continent emergence? Let's start from the uh, basics. Uh, we have this uh, the exposure of Siberia crust is controlled by the uh, topographic variation and the seawater depth, two important factors. When you have a small topographic variation compared to the seawater depth, the topographic contrast is less than the seawater depth, then everything will be submerged. We will have a submerged surface. But if you have more topographic variation, the topographic contrast is larger than the seawater depth, then you will have partially emerged surfaces. And this is the situation. That's the situation for Earth today. Do I get a basic pointer? No. I see, I see. Okay, cool. We will have, this is the situation for Earth today. We have sufficient uh, topographic variation, topographic contrast. The continents are high enough. So why do continents write high? Uh, any crust across the oceanic crust or a continental crust, they're less dense than the mantle. So it's like an iceberg floating in the ocean. That's the uh, basic idea of area isostasy. So over long wavelength, isostatic equilibrium is largely maintained. So elevation will correlate with crustal thickness, such that the higher, the thicker the crust, the higher the uh, elevation. The continental crust is slightly less dense than, than the oceanic crust, but it turns out that this density difference is not that important. It's not the first, uh, first important thing. The continental crust is much, much thicker than the oceanic crust. Today, the average continental crust thickness is uh, 30 to 40 kilometers, but the oceanic crust uh, is on average 70 kilometers. So that's why, that's why continents are uh, right high. But what I'm going to show you next is that elevation cannot increase indefinitely with crustal thickening. Let's take a look at the Andes. The Andean mountain belt is like a 7,000 kilometers, and there are sufficient variations in uh, crustal thickness and elevation that would allow us to uh, examine the relationship between the two. So, uh, as you can see, there is a nice correlation between elevation and crustal thickness below 60 kilometers thick crust, below 60 kilometers. But once you go above 60 kilometers, this correlation breaks down. Elevation does not increase further with further crustal thickening. So obviously there is a kink in this correlation between crustal thickness and elevation. 
And the simplest explanation for this kink is that there is a major density increase at about 60 kilometers. So we did this uh, phase equilibrium modeling, and we find that uh, this is 60 kilometers. This is the depth where the Andean lower crust becomes largely acclimatized and surpasses the mantle by density. This, uh, this uh, phase equilibrium modeling is done by one of my uh, uh, graduate student, Hao Cheng, and he's also sitting in the audience. So this is the uh, density reversal line. Below this line, the crust is less dense than the mantle. But once you go above the line, the crust becomes denser than the mantle. This, the, this is the density reversal line. And this rapid density increase is due to the formation of some uh, high density minerals, particularly garnet. So garnet can form from high pressure metamorphism, or it could just uh, crystallize directly from the magmas at high pressure. So it could be metamorphic or uh, magmatic, but it doesn't matter. So now very, strict, very strictly, we call it lower crustal acclimatization. And as a consequence of lower crust acclimatization, elevation will not increase further with crustal thickening. Actually, actually, it may even decrease a little bit because these uh, acclimatized lower crust is so dense, it's, den it's denser than the mantle. So this uh, high density acclimatized lower crust is like a heavy weight hanging beneath this uh, buoyant crust above, and it will cause a root pool effect. Well, one phase for this uh, high density lower crust is that it may just detach and fall off into the mantle, but the time scales can be uncertain. But in any case, uh, this petrologic transition at high pressure uh, directly limits how high mountain belts can rise on modern Earth, and that's about 45 kilometers. Here I'm talking about the average height, the average height over some large areas, not the height of individual mountain peaks, because, because those mountain peaks are too small and they may not be in perfect isostatic equilibrium. And for them, other factors may come into play. So we figured that this uh, root pool effect should also apply to early Earth. But for early Earth, there are several things we don't know. First, we don't know the dominant tectonic regime on early Earth, for example, in Archean. We don't know if there was plate tectonics or was there was it dominated by stagnant lead, stag, stagnant lead tectonics, we just don't know. But, but actually, this doesn't matter that much because whatever the uh, dominant uh, tectonic style, uh, the average surface topography will still obey the principles of isostasy. And second, we don't know the extent and the mechanisms of crustal thickening on early Earth. Well, the mechanisms don't matter either because ultimately it's the uh, crustal thickness that matters, that determines the elevation or elevation contrast. For the extent of crustal thickening, yes, we don't know. There are large uncertainties in this, and it's also depend on maybe the uh, dominant tectonic regime. But it's possible, for example, it's possible, it's just possible that crustal thickening may have been uh, less efficient on early Earth because it, it was hot, the crust was hot and squishy. But in any case, this uh, uh, root pool effect will still exert a topographic upper bound for a thickening crust. It may not thicken to the conditions uh, of lower crust acclimatization, but it's there, so it will exert a topographic upper, upper bound. You cannot go beyond that the elevation. So we assume that the crust at the Moho is mafic and ultra mafic. So we did this uh, similar phase equilibrium modeling for the Archean mafic and ultra mafic rocks. We want to find out at what depth, at what depth the Archean lower crust become largely acclimatized and surpass the mantle by density. So the first row, uh, you might not be able to see the uh, the words are just too small, the titles. The first word is for Archean basalt, and the second row for Archean ultramafic rocks. And we consider anhydrous conditions and water saturated conditions. So these will be the end member cons uh, conditions. So overall, overall, uh, there are some uncertainties about the uh, temperature range of the Archean lower crust, but just based on the uh, metamorphic records, we have this sort of a large range, and within this large range, the overall upper bound of the pressure of density reversal is about 1.5 to 1.8 gigapascal.
this is uh, this is similar to, or I would say maybe less than that of the uh, Andean crust. So this would mean that the Archean crust would become quickly or quickly lose its buoyancy as it thickens. And what about the uh, oceanic crust? Because the uh, maximum topographic contrast would also uh, depend on the uh, oceanic crust thickness. The oceanic crustal uh, thickness is depending on the uh, melting melting degree, which in turn depends on the uh, potential temperature of the uh, upwelling or upper mantle. So the higher the potential temperature, the larger this melting regime, this melting window, and the thicker the oceanic crust is going to produce. In the Archean, uh, it's a little bit debated, but most people would agree that in the Archean, the upper mantle may have been at least 200 degrees C hotter than it is today. So according to Claude Hertzberg's calculation, that would produce 25 to 35 kilometers thick oceanic crust or any crust in general. So we're now, we, we're now faced with a uh, dilemma for making continent emerges. So in the Archean, this oceanic crust is so thick and the thickness of the uh, oceanic crust was set a uh, minimum thickness for the emerged crust or the continental crust, whatever you want to call it, the emerged crust. So with this thick oceanic crust, you will need even thicker continental crust or thicker emerged crust for emergence to happen in the first place. But as we, as we have just talked about, uh, the Archean crust would quickly lose its buoyancy as it thickens. So that's the dilemma for the continent emerges. So we calculate, we want to bring it to the, we quantify this, uh, uh, dilemma. We calculate this uh, elevation contrast, elevation contrast for the Archean and modern crust. Uh, we consider anhydrous crust and anhydrous crust conditions because they have slightly different uh, intervals or the, the pressure range for the density reversal to take place. For example, for the uh, this is gray line. This gray line is for the modern day Andean crust, the modern or, or the Phanerozoic orogenic crust. Uh, and it hits its uh, density reversal point at about 60 kilometers. And after that, you will have this root ball effect and elevation will not increase further or may just uh, decrease a little bit with further thickening. So that will happen to the Archea crust too. And uh, these red and the pink lines are for the Archea and the Felsic and Mafic crust because uh, there's so much debate on the Archean crustal composition. So we consider both scenarios. So, after they hit their density reversal, similar to the Andean crust, their elevation should not increase further and may even decrease a little bit, but more or less the same, very slowly. So as you can see, uh, the elevation contrast for modern crust can go all the way up to eight kilometers before it hit the limit, upper limit, the topographic uh, upper bound. But for the Archean crust, whether it's a Felsic crust or Mafic crust, it will stop at about four kilometers. Uh, for the hydrous crust, it will get slightly above four, but very close to four kilometers. So that's about half of that of the present day. So that would mean that the Archean surfaces may have been much, much flatter than they are today. So I put this uh, uh, modern seawater height in a plot, four kilometers on average, or seawater depth, four kilometers on average, you will find that it's very difficult for large areas of continents to emerge from the oceans, from the oceans. So that's, that's considering that the oceans were similarly uh, voluminous in the past. There are, so far there's no, there's no evidence that the oceans were less voluminous in the past. Actually, uh, based on the hydrogen isotopes and mineral physics, the oceans were probably more voluminous in the past. So that would make continent emerges even more difficult, even more uh, unlikely. So just based on uh, the very basic principles of isostasy and this uh, petrologic considerations, it's actually very difficult to have continents to emerge from the early oceans. Earth appears to be inevitably flooded by a global ocean in, in its early history. And only the highest peaks, highest peaks may have stayed above the sea level and forming these uh, isolated islands. So these islands may have sustained the uh, 
limited the important Siberian weathering in the early history. So an interesting question that follows here is that what the elevation distribution might look like on early Earth before continent emerges. Well, we, we may take a look at the uh, Moho sharpness. A sharp Moho is generally believed to be formed after the delamina delamination of some uh, dense materials from the lower crust. So this is a box work, and they compare the Moho sharpness on Craton, on Craton, and off Craton. And overall, the Archean Cratonic crust is very sharp, has very sharp Moho. So that would mean that most of the Archean crust did reach the uh, conditions of lower crust eclogitization. So let's go back to this, uh, this plot that shows the uh, relationship between elevation contrast and continental crust thickness. So once you reach the uh, lower crust uh, eclogitization conditions or density reversal conditions, then your elevation will not change much with further crustal thickness. So actually, it doesn't matter what crustal thickness you have or whether or not the dense roots delaminate for all these Archean thickened crust, they will pretty much have the same elevation. So this will cause the uh, formation of, of a preferential level or a preferential elevation for all Archean thickened crust. And because of this uh, preferential elevation, preferential level, the Archean hypsometry might also look by model, by model, with one mode for the uh, all Archean thickened crust and the other mode for the regular uh, oceanic crust. And these thickened crust will, uh, may have formed this uh, submerged plateaus. But please note that this uh, high elevation mode, this two mode, high elevation mode in the Archean is actually different from that of today. The high elevation mode in the Archean is controlled by the lower crust eclogitization. And the high mode today is at sea level. It's controlled by erosion and deposition balance. And also note that this uh, elevation difference between the two modes in the Archean is much smaller than that of today. It's simply because the surface was much flatter in the Archean. There's not much uh, uh, elevation variation. So eventually, when these uh, submerged plateaus rose, eventually may even emerge from the oceans, what would happen? And because these plateaus, these submerged plateaus, they had pretty much the same elevations. They were flat. So when they rose, when it emerged, the Siberian crust, the expansion of Siberian crust would go from like a, almost nothing and then suddenly to everything. So emergence will be very fast. Expansion will be very fast. The, the growth of the Siberia crust may have been highly non-uniformitarian, and this we we speculate that this process may have had some catastrophic environmental consequences. Well, I guess uh, that's what I have to say today. But here are some questions we may try to answer in the future. Uh, first question: What triggered continent emergence? What's the uh, connection to maybe plate tectonics? Did the oce oceanic crust become thinner uh, either due to secular mantle cooling or maybe associated with the uh, accelerated cooling uh, due to the onset of plate tectonics? But we know that the timing of plate tectonics is a highly debated subject, so we don't know. And what about the secular seawater loss, either due to uh, water subduction or water deep recycling into the mantle or maybe just water evaporation and hydrogen escape into space. And because, uh, because the expansion or the growth of Siberia crust may have been so fast, so rapid, what could be the environmental consequences, especially if continent emerges did happen before a great oxidation event based on the uh, observations like the uh, uh, triple oxygen isotopes. And then, this gives us the last question, exactly when did continental crust emerge from the oceans? There, are, there have been some important observations made related to uh, this question, but still, we don't have a solid answer to this question. So to wrap up, elevation increases with crustal thickness. 
but there is a limit to how high elevations can rise by crustal thickening because once the crust thickness uh, ex exceeds 40 to 60 kilometers, the mafic lower crust will quickly densify and triggers this uh, root pool effect. It doesn't matter whether the crust reaches the uh, conditions of uh, the root pool or lower crust eclogitization, but still the root pool will be there and exert a topographic upper bound for the uh, for thickening crust. And this root pool effect combined with thicker oceanic crust may have made the surfaces much flatter in the Archean or on early Earth than they are today. Thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks a lot, Ming Tang, for a fascinating talk. Um, please, everyone in the room, there are two microphones in the staircase. Feel free to step up and ask questions. We have lots of time for questions. Uh, have, have you thought at all about the effect of Snowball Earth episodes on continental emergence, some of them at least as old as 2.9 billion? Thanks. The Snowball Earth uh, episodes, the, uh, can you be a little bit more detailed why, why this would matter? I can't hear, sorry. These, these glaciations were vast and um, in some cases amounted to some 800 meters or more of sea level drop. So you have an emergence right there. How would that affect your um, continental emergence? Uh, if you put a lot of water as uh, continental ice, yeah, that might just lower the uh, sea level and have some uh, emerged lands. But I guess these will be transient signatures or transient uh, features because the snowball earth, I don't know how, how long it lasted or even if there was a uh, snowball earth at 2.9, but that's my best guess. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for the talk. It was very enjoyable. Um, in your modeling, where you were modeling the density of the lower protocrust, you assumed that it was made of Archean commodities and magnesium rich basalts. But we don't see any high grade versions of those rocks on the earth today. They're all green schist to amphibolite. So do you think we have any evidence to say that that's, those were the materials that the lower crust was actually made from? Actually, we don't know the uh, lower crust compositions very precisely. So that's why we consider uh, two end members, either basaltic lower crust or ultramafic, mafic or ultramafic composition. So we took the average of basalts and then average of commodities or ultramafic rocks and see uh, how their density increases with crustal thickening. And we find that, so this is the, actually the upper bound. Actually, for ultramafic rocks, you get to the density reversal even earlier than basalts, just based on the uh, phase equilibrium modeling. But yeah, we're not that certain about the lower crust composition. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ming, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, from a geodynamic perspective, if you invoke uh, uh, the pool from ecologization, that there is a time scale associated with that, right? It, it is gravita gravitational unstable. So once the dripping happens, there will be a mental upwinding and corresponding rebound, which actually increase the topography. So if it's really a matter of the time scale, right? How, on which time scale the ecologite pool is acting and on which time scale the dynamic topography is sustaining. And if you consider these two competing effects, how will this be further applied to your subsequent modeling? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you're asking about the uh, dynamic topography and that's, that could be associated with mantle flow dynamics. But uh, actually, what we are mostly interested in here is the uh, elevation, the long lasting elevation at isostatic equilibrium because these uh, dynamic topography, they won't last over tens of million years. They're sort of like a transient uh, topography, transient deformation signatures, and they will just go away at on like a hundred million year time scales. So over longer time scales, uh, isostatic equilibrium is more important. Yes, but the dripping is also a very transient process, which means the uh, gravitational pull will also be transient, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, that could be interesting. I, I have I've never thought about that. That's an interesting point. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your talk. And I think uh, some information about the uh, increasing continental freeboard could maybe be gained from the composition of banded iron formations, where you do see decoupling of hafnium and endymium isotope systems by around 2.7 billion years. And that may point towards selective continental weathering. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so you're saying there are Siberia weathering signatures? Yes, it's uh, preserved in uh, banded iron formations, for example, the Timagami formation mm -hmm. in Canada. You do observe that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely possible. So I'm not saying that there, were, there was no Siberia weathering before, let's say, large area kind of emerges. It could be just small areas of, you know, isolated islands. So I don't know the size of these islands could, could be, but uh, uh, in terms of uh, the relative size, it's not as massive as, you know, the continents that we are talking about, that we know today. That's all, all about the relative stuff. Yeah. I just was pointing out that that might be a tool to, in the geological record to check for this. Uh-huh, sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot. If we go to the Kapvalkraton, we have um, sediments of three billion years old in the Witz Basin. It occurs to me there we may have a test of your model because we've got emergent um, uh, crust, we have old crust, and we ha have xenoliths from beneath the crust as well. And so it may be possible to put that information together and build a test of your model from about three giga years. Sure, sure. Uh, actually, uh, it's, 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 uh, I agree that it's an idea to put all these uh, sedimentary records and xenoliths records to test the hypothesis of emergence, the timing of emergence. Uh, actually, I don't know when the continents emerge from the oceans. It could, it could happen early on in the Archean, or it's just by the end of the Archean, or even later, if you look at, for example, some of the Sinti stuff, it could be very late. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that before it's emerges, what's what's causing the emergence problem for the continents but i agree that it's always a nice, good idea to you know have more data more records to figure out when continents emerge from the oceans because that's very important for the surface environment mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your uh a uh, good talk, and uh, you showed me a very novel picture on the uh, early Earth uh, in a simple way. Uh, that's very imp impressive. So I noticed uh, you used uh, the ancient uh, uh, continental thickness, but uh, in your model you use the modern uh, sea, uh, sea level highlight. So uh, what do you think uh, uh, this question? Is there any uh, differences between the model and uh, the ancient uh, sea? Uh, height. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we actually try to avoid this uh, seawater stuff in our work because we just don't know anything about seawater level. Uh, so it's it's controlled by two things, right? It's competing. It's like a balance between it's a balance between the topographic contrast, how much topo topography you can have, and then how much seawater you have at any point, at any point, or on any planet, right? For gen in general, so. Just based on our calculation, we can only show the Earth was flatter. The surfaces were like uh, the, the the maximum elevation contrast is four four kilometers in, compared to compared to eight kilometers today. It's half half of that. So if the oceans were less voluminous, okay, yes, then you might have some emerged continents early on. But so far, according to my limited knowledge about this uh, very you know, debated then that oceans were, is actually the opposite, is more favored. The oceans were likely more voluminous in the past based on like hydrogen isotopes and uh, mineral physics considerations. Thank you so much. Thank you. There is time for one short question. Very short. Sure. <laughs> uh, thanks for the very interesting talk, very good. So just out of curiosity, does actually this calculation uh, not predict that uh, the early continental crust or the early emerged crust is actually felsic and not mafic? And we know that 3.5 billion years ago, we already have clastic sediments. Mm -hmm. So you're asking, does it have any implication for the composition? 
Yes, because uh, our key and Mayfi crossed, it seems really difficult to get demerged. Yeah. Uh, if you ask me, I would say the Felsic crust, most of the Felsic crust may have formed in a late Archean, but also uh, in our 2016 paper, based on the terrigen sediments reconstruction, there could be up to 30, 40% granite in the crust that might actually compensate for some of the effects or explain the uh, sedimentary signatures that you see in some of the Archean cratons. I'm not sure if that uh, answered the question. Yes, partly, it seems to be, if you make a mix uh, 30, 40, 30, 70, it's very difficult. Uh -huh. But, uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ming. Ming.